Welcome to the Fish Casting Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner of Fish Facts TV. Today, Tim is out in Alabama, I believe, hunting some bucks and does. So uh, it's just going to be me today. And I wanted to clarify our new name instead of the Fish Casting Podcast with Captain Tim and Fish Facts TV. We are now Fish Casting the Fishing Podcast. Um, there's a lot of fishing podcasts, but we think it will make our name more searchable. All right, guys. So Tim's hunting, and I just texted him to confirm he shot some really nice deer. Um, I have a podcast we recorded right before Thanksgiving that I'm going to kind of add on to the end of this, but I wanted to get some fresh content uh, and make it a little bit longer because I think that one was only about 20 minutes. And I've done a lot of fishing this week. And I anticipate having guests and doing fishing next week. So I think we're going to have uh, plenty of content to fill those uh, future podcasts. So the first thing I want to talk about, the Spanish mackerel are in Miami. So two of my four trips this week were targeting Spanish mackerel. And no, I was not getting the quantity of Spanish mackerel that I was getting uh, in Jacksonville back in April, but there were still um, quite a few. And, you know, most of my Spanish mackerel fishing has been done uh, under the close tutelage of my father. So I myself am not a sharpened, a Spanish mackerel fisherman is my, as my dad. Nonetheless, we still caught five and probably got cut off by another two or three um, the first day we were going from the Rickenbacker Pier in uh, Miami, and we were fishing from the pier. The, the one we caught was chumming, and it hit a chunk of pilcher. And the we also got a lot of small yellowtail. The small yellowtail have come into the bay in numbers, which before I go more into the next day Spanish mackerel, I want to talk about an idea that I kind of sharpened this week. So when it comes to snapper and catching, especially little mangrove snapper, little yellowtail snappers, my much of my thought has always been, you know, if we're catching little snappers, there must be big snappers around. And, you know, I think that was more of something that would, that I would qualify as wishful thinking. Because especially this week, I caught so many tiny mangroves and tiny yellowtails. And the fact of the matter is that snapper have complex life histories. And oftentimes the smaller individuals live inshore and the bigger individuals live offshore. So if you are catching a lot of eight inch mangrove snapper, then yes, there's probably 10 to 11 inch mangrove snapper that are keepers that are around there. But if you are catching four inch mangrove snapper, while Sure, there's a possibility that there are bigger fish. The, the fact of the matter is, if you, prop, if you catch more than five snapper under six inches without any larger fish mixed in, and larger, I mean like eight or nine inches, they're probably not going to be any keepers at that spot. And maybe there are keepers, maybe they're deeper, maybe they're around that spot. But whatever you're doing that's bringing in the little fish is preventing you from getting the big fish. Because there's something else I've talked about in my videos called a snapper ratio. So usually when you're catching snappers, you have a ratio of undersized snappers to keeper snappers. So usually if I'm catching mangrove snappers, I'm happy with about a five to one ratio. Five undersized snapper for one keeper snapper. That means you catch, you know, 25 snapper or about 30 snappers, somewhere 25 to 30 snapper, and you get your five keepers. That, that to me, when you're fishing inshore mangrove snappers, um, that is what, what, what is, what is realistically ideal. Obviously there are certain times where you're going to have a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, when we were fishing the mullet run snapper, that's often a one-to-one -one ratio. Every, if you're using a whole mullet for bait, every snapper you catch is probably going to be a snapper. And I guess I'll kind of bring this full circle to yellowtail. So yesterday, um, so then the next day we went to the Keys, again, small yellowtail, small mangroves. Yesterday we were out on the boat chumming for yellowtail. 
And again, at first we were getting those six inch fish, but then we started to get the eight inch fish and a couple 10 inch fish. And once you start getting that close to that keeper size, you know that there, there do have to be some keepers down there. You know, if you're catching fish an inch short, there are definitely keeper fish down there. So we had a lot of live pilchards. Um, and what I started doing, because the live pilchards wouldn't swim down and we were really shallow. We were in 35 feet. And so what I started doing was killing those pilchards. So they were just maybe barely alive. And that's how we started getting the keepers. Uh, we ended up with four uh, keeper yellowtail. My buddy was on the phone. So I was, when the bite was hot, I was the only one fishing. Um, I caught four myself. Um, the bite kind of slowed down. We went to go move spots. We were gonna try to go a little bit deeper um, maybe to like 45 or 50 to try to increase that ratio because there still were primarily those eight, nine inch fish, um, which were nonstop. You know, if you threw a little piece of shrimp down, you were going to catch an eight, nine inch fish. Um, and our anchor got hung up on some rocks. We lost the anchor. It was very disappointing. We ended up deep dropping for the rest of the afternoon and pulling out a couple tile fish. But those yellowtail, I think because it's the winter, the bigger yellowtail are coming into shallow water along with the Spanish mackerel, which is what I actually plan to talk about. So I told you the first Spanish mackerel we caught chumming off the pier. The next day we had the boat, we decided we were gonna troll for Spanish mackerel. So I didn't really know where to troll for Spanish mackerel other than right next to the pier where we'd caught one from shore. So we trolled out there in the morning, we didn't get anything. We trolled through bear cut, we trolled all around the bay, we finally got one uh, by Bill Baggs State Park. If you've ever been out to Bill Baggs State Park, there's a bunch of small piers um, that are only, you know, 10 feet off the shore. So we were going through, there's, it's not an official channel, but it's a natural channel. There's a lot of lobster traps you got to uh, go through, but it is like 15 feet deep. So we were pulling through there and we started picking up Spanish mackerel. We caught one there and we went a little bit over towards Stiltsville and we got three more. Now within those Spanish mackerel, we were also getting a lot of blue runners and a lot of leather jacks. And what we were doing to get those Spanish mackerel on the troll is we were using six ounce trolling weights with Clark spoons. Now we were using silver and gold, pretty small. I can't remember the exact size, but they were about three inches long, small Clark spoons uh, trolled. And there were, there, there were a good amount of mackerel, but there were so many leather jacks. Uh, so I think we're actually gonna go back tomorrow and try to do that again, uh, depending on how the weather looks. But uh, we, got, we got four keeper Spanish, and then we came back in to another one of my favorite inshore spots. And on those live pilchards, and I think I figured out how to get the live pilchards, uh, at least for the winter, we got the mangroves. So it, it was good. We got three nice mangroves. We got a lot of pilchards. Um, so we got a lot of Spanish. We got Spanish um, two days. We got yellowtail one day. So it was a great week of fishing. The trip down to the Keys was a little disappointing, but again, I never get the weather. The weather's been bad. So hopefully my boat club reservation is clear by today or tomorrow so I can try to get um, another reservation for next week. So um, I think this will be it for my addendum, but I also wanted to say we're expanding. We have two guests hopefully next week, so I'll probably stagger those releases, um, but we got two guests coming up. And um, I, I just want to say, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, we have a good amount of people on YouTube, but we also have um, a good amount of people on podcasts, but we would like to expand our footprint on the Apple iTunes podcast. And if you guys, the listeners can do two things for me. First, if you could rate us five stars on iTunes, and if you could leave a review, that would be great. I know that takes time. I don't really leave reviews on other people's podcasts, so I cannot blame you if you don't. And the second thing is, if you could tell one person, you know, obviously our primary listener base, because it, it, it gives us uh, analytics, is Tampa and Miami, where both of us live. But we do always get a couple random places, random cities, um, maybe you just heard from my Instagram or Tim's Instagram, or maybe it's friends of ours. But if you could just tell one person and just be like, hey, you know, you got a fishing buddy, tell your fishing buddy to listen to this fishing podcast if they like to talk about fishing because we're just normal guys talking fishing 
talking tactics. And there are not a ton of fishing podcasts. There's a couple. And I actually reached out to a couple of the guys, see if they would want to have me as a guest on their, their fishing podcast. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to have a really good holiday slate for you guys. And uh, yeah, here, enjoy the rest of the podcast that we recorded a couple weeks ago. All right, Tim, you won't believe it, but uh, the wind has still been blowing here in Miami. So I managed to do a little bit of fishing. I went out two days. So uh, I guess I'll just start with the, with the first one and that was Friday. Um, so Friday I went out and I wanted to try the Deerfield Beach Pier. Uh, it's one of the most popular piers. Deerfield is at the south end of Palm Beach County. So it's about a 45 minute drive uh, for me and boy, the wind was howling. So um, I'd heard some people catching pompano in the area. So that's what I really went out targeting. Um, I threw on some clams and I threw on some live shrimp. I was fishing very, very shallow. So there's people fishing further out on the pier. I dropped down there and I fished for about two hours and I only got a single bite and it slammed me and I fought it. It was fighting like a pompano, but uh, could have been a Jack Creval. And I, I had it almost up and I don't know what happened. I, I was holding my other rod, trying to get it into the rod holder. And I don't know if it hit the pier or what, but it broke my 30 pound leader um, and it came off. So that, that was my only bite all morning at that pier. Um, I did see some other guys pull out a nice black drum, probably eight to 10 pound black drum right off the pier. So that, that, was, uh, that was really impressive to see. But after about two hours, it, it just wasn't really doing it for me. So I decided I was going to try the Boynton Beach Pier, which is the next pier uh, north. And so it, it's about 15 minutes from the highway, but from the uh, Deerfield Beach Pier, it was about 30 minutes. So I got to the Boynton Beach Pier. Uh, I brought some chum. So I dropped the chum in the water. And, and again, it, it started out a little slow, caught a little ringtail pinfish, uh, but then a, a nice school of decent sized uh, Jack Rivals came by. So I ended up catching two of those, both, you know, probably three, four pounds. So not huge ones, but uh, big enough to put up a really solid fight. Um, and then I, I just kept fishing, got a couple little mangroves and I, I ended up getting one really nice uh, 13, 14 inch mangrove. So not the most successful day I've ever had, but uh, overall I, I would say it was a pretty decent success. Nice, Tanner. Now, you mentioned you brought out clams with you. Did you have any luck on those clams or, or were you mainly catching on shrimp? Um, so the jack and snapper were all on shrimp and even the good pompano bite was also on shrimp. I was getting some nibbles. Uh, I went further out on the pier um, and I was getting some nibbles. I don't know what the nibbles were on. Um, I think they were just small sergeant majors and like little small pecker fish, but I, I didn't get, I didn't have too much luck, but my dad says that in his experience in Jacksonville, he has uh, some of the best luck for Pompano fishing with clams. Yeah, it's definitely uh, an interesting bait. Um, I actually had a bunch of clams in the freezer that I got a couple months ago. I was gonna be saving them up to, to try them out. Mind you, these are 25 kilogram cases, they're huge. Um, cases of clams, but um, I was hoping that you got them on clams so I could finally use them for something, but I guess they'll, they'll stay put in the freezer. Yeah, unfortunately, the clams were, were not the ticket. Um, hard to beat live shrimp, but uh, like I said, it wasn't the best day I ever had, but it, it, was, uh, it was decent, and, I, and I'd call, us, call it a, a reasonable success, and any sort of pier fishing and good-sized mangrove snapper um, equals a good video. So the, the video got a ton of uh, views and likes already. And I also wanted to mention, I did see another guy get a really nice uh, nurse shark right next to me uh, when I was catching that mangrove. But uh, all right, we'll talk about yesterday. Yesterday, uh, I finally got the back in the boat and I got offshore. The conditions were still pretty bad. Uh, you know, it was very windy and uh, we, we were only allowed to go offshore for the first half of the day. We tried a couple different things and, you know, nothing was really biting. We got two 
uh, Graysby groupers, uh, little sandwich groupers, the strawberry groupers, as a lot of people call them. Um, so, so we did get two of those and we got a little tile fish, um, but offshore just really, the, the current and the wind were going in opposite directions, which made it really hard to drift fish. Uh, we saw one dolphin in shallow water and we saw another person in a, in a boat bias uh, dolphin fishing. So I'm really hoping to try to figure out kite fishing within the next couple weeks. Uh, so then we came inshore mm. and uh, I had a work friend and his wife with me and uh, she'd never caught a fish before. So we, we chummed up uh, a flat and we just got her on. Uh, I think she caught, you know, everything was small, but mangrove snapper, lane snapper, yellowtail snapper, grunts, um, little blue runners, flounders. So nothing big, but, you know, we got her on her first fish. And uh, so, so, you know, I don't know if I would be a success by my terms, but considering we only had a couple hours offshore, um, I'd call it a moderate success. Yeah, I think you did pretty good. You know, even if uh, you didn't catch the, the fish that you wanted to catch, you know, get into the pee or, or whatever. Any time you can introduce a new fisherman to the first time they catch a fish and you know one of your adult friends you know that that's really neat to be able to uh, uh pass on something you're passionate about so that, that fires me up that's really cool that you were able to uh to pass that on to her now you mentioned the graysby um did you keep those graysbies uh we, we kept one of them so we actually were we were fishing a actually a large sabiki tipped with squid um and so we caught uh, two on one. It was a, a single drop. We caught both of them. So we kept the bigger of the two and threw the little one back. And my, my friend said they were, they were pretty good. Yeah, they're great. Um, you know, they're, they're a bycatch for us, you know, when we're, when we're spur grouper fishing every once in a while, you get one um, or two or three. Yeah, we, we love them over here. There's, there's no size limit to them. Um, they, uh, they're very tasty for sure. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a true grouper, and, and I don't really think they're a fish that anybody really ever targets. I don't know. I've never heard of anybody, you know, getting them in any sort of quantity. It's always, but for here, I want to say they're considered in your grouper bag limit. So um, I don't know if people are really keeping a lot if they're targeting big mm -hmm. groupers, but in a situation like we did where you're just, you know, kind of pick them up and especially on a slow day offshore, you know, it's a grouper. It tastes like grouper as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. They're, they're super tasty. Um, that, that's a good insight um, on the bag limit. I'd, I'd have to check and see if um, definitely something uh, I'll be looking into now. We thought that they were on unregulated side, but. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe they're not in the Gulf. Uh, the, I was just looking at um, Atlantic State Waters on my, my fish rules app. Um, and that's how I, how I came across that. But let me double check. You know, I, I always had some trouble kind of distinguishing the, the difference between a uh, Graysby and let's see. Yeah, legally harvested. Yeah, it doesn't say not to be counted for the purpose of that. I don't know, maybe it's not, maybe, I don't know. This, this, uh, this app could be fooling me, but uh, I, I, that's the way I'd understood it. But uh, all right, enough about me. Let me tell me about your fishing day. Well, I finally got out um, after weeks and weeks uh, of the boat sitting on the trailer. I was finally able to make it out. Um, it, I was determined to go regardless of conditions. And we had some very poor conditions. Um, same as we've been dealing with over the past weeks and months, it seemed like. Um, very strong winds on uh, Saturday went out. And it was 15 to 20 knots out of the east northeast, um, spitting rain. Where if you're under the t top, you don't really get wet, but when you're up on and running around, uh, you get soaked. Uh, my wife was with me. I think she wore three jackets the entire day. Um, <laughs> it was just a not a fun day. It was chilly. Um, I broke my cast net right out of the gate. The the swivel right at the top on my first cast. Uh, luckily, I was able to, to grab a, a rod right next to me and hook the net itself as it was sitting there sinking away from me on the flat. Um, I was able to grab a, a 3 8 ounce jig head, throw it at it, hook the net, managed to keep most of the uh, white bait that were in there. But 
<laughs> uh, that kind of set the tone for the day. Uh, I, I'd like to think <laughs> um, it was cold. It was miserable. We ended up going uh, into kind of the, the western side of Tampa Bay, up by Weedon Island and back in some backwater areas. Um, anyone that's familiar with fishing Tampa probably heard of Weedon Island. It's a very popular um, uh, island that, that has great fishing and it's a very fishy area, productive spot. Um, redfish, trout, uh, kind of the big three over here. Um, for me, I don't have a trolling motor on my boat, and, and most of the really productive spots that you uh, can go are um, no internal combustion engine zones. So that naturally, uh, without a trolling motor or a polling platform and, and a, a boat, offshore boat with a deep V, that gets me going there. So I had to do some, some different uh, sort of things. Um, I like to fish the docks in that area. Uh, there's some, some deep water canals that are mangrove lined. Um, ended up uh, throwing shrimp and white bait up to some mangroves and docks. Um, got on some sheep's head, snapper, let them go. Um, I was really, I was really kind of troubled that I wasn't sure or any snook. Um, I was throwing everything under the sun, and I, um, I ended up having to switch my game up. Normally, when I'm fishing for snooks and uh, throw free lined white bait or free lined pinfish up to the dock. And let it kind of swim down in this in the snook and reds ambush it but um this time i ended up uh in some docks with some really strong current and the, the bait just wasn't getting down I ended up using a really small fish finder rig with a a, a great sounds a sliding weight leader and a, a one-on hook and i was getting redfish after redfish once i made that change it was you know getting six or eight of them in the boat boom 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 right after i made that change um, they weren't eating pinfish. They were only eating really small white bait on that sliding knocker rig. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, my wife ended up catching the biggest fish again, uh, of the day, of course, um, with minimal help from me, but, uh, it ended up being a nice day. You know, uh, it was, it was tough sledding at first with conditions. Um, and that's that thing and I about drove back in. I was so ticked off after that happened. Um, I made a, an on-water mend of the net. It took us a couple hours to find the fish. They weren't where I thought we ended up finding them, uh, having a good day, and uh, turned out to be a great day on the water. Um, went out. It's been driving me bananas not being able to get out for, seems like, years. So it ended up being very nice. Yeah, sounds like uh, you were able to make some lemons out of lemonade and kind of adapt and overcome and, uh, you know, end up making some some good fishing out of that day. Um, now, how big was that uh, biggest redfish your wife caught? Yeah, these these reds weren't huge. You know, they were right in inch range. They were all at the bottom end of the slot, with a couple of them probably dipping out of the the, the bottom end of the slot. The one that she was twenty inches or so. Um, I didn't end up measuring any of them. They they aren't in season right now. We're still on a closure from red tide in West Central Florida from two years ago. So, you know, I, I would say most of them we caught were, were probably around 18, but she caught the, she caught the biggest one uh, at about 20. It did get broken off by something, um, got a really good hit on one of those white bait, um, came to it real, real heavy, big head shake, but there was a boat driving by uh, at a slow rate of speed. And I didn't like to profile docks that I'm fishing. I never want to come up tight, you know, have a big bow in the rod, uh, just, just to not give my spots away. You know, there's, there's a couple docks that <laughs> I, uh, I cherish because of how productive they are. This was one of them. Um, so I was fighting it kind of down low to my side so he couldn't see it. And it just got me in the dock. I, I didn't really like, I want to showcase what I was doing, you know, really trying to do much. So, uh, ended up losing, it's probably a really nice redfish, but, um, you know, it is what it is. I'll sacrifice one redfish to uh, be able to go back and get, uh, catch them. So, yeah, it's funny. Back in Jacksonville, uh, we we used to call those rat reds. Those little, you know, just under slot. Uh, you know, we don't get them here in Miami. Mm -hmm. I, I actually got a decent one, or I mean, one probably about that size off my parents' stock about a year ago. But you know, in the past couple of years, I, I haven't caught a lot of redfish. Um, I've caught a handful in Chuckalusky, um, and I've caught, 
you know, maybe one or two in Jacksonville, but growing up, that was really my bread and butter. So, you know, those redfish are just such a great uh, all around fish. Yeah, uh, I really like them in that size. You know, obviously I can catch those big, those big bowls and everything, but they're just so many fish at, you know, rat red stage. You know, these ones were just the blue tail and, and uh, you know, just really, um, really good looking fish. Makes you, uh, for the fishery, after how bad of a red tide we have. And then with the, these that, it's working, you know, th this stock, it's, it's getting bigger. They're getting into the slot range just on one dock we caught, you know, so it made me happy to see that, uh, that there was a lot of the small ones and they're going to grow up. There's a, uh, there'll be the, those big bowls. So we'll see. All right, guys, uh, this week, the fish of the week is the Jack Creval, uh, Karanks hippos. Um, and that is a common species across much of the East and Gulf coast. Um, as far north, I think they probably get them in Massachusetts all the way past Brazil. And they do, I believe, catch them on the uh, west coast of Africa as well. And I think even maybe as far south as, or as far north as Spain. Very, very popular fish. One of the, the best fighting fish you'll find, uh, but also not maybe one of the best eating. So, Tim, you have any thoughts on the Jack Ravel? Yeah, uh, Jack Reval are a great fighting fish, as you mentioned. Um, you know, people call them canal tuna just because of their brute strength. You know, pound for pound, they're some of the best fighting fish out there. Um, as far as table fare, I have eaten them. Um, they're not the best. They're not the worst. Um, I think they have a stigma against them. Um, if you bleed them out right away, um, they're pretty good to smoke and make fish spread out of, but um, as far as jacks, you know, if you get on a school of jacks, you know, you mentioned you had uh, a coworker uh, who had never caught a fish before earlier episode, and uh, I think if you were to put put them on a, a big school of jacks, just catching one after the next, uh, probably would have had a great time and, and made it an even better memory. But I think they're great for people that are beginning to fish or just want something to really pull on the line. They're they're a strong fish and. I always look forward to seeing a big old school or getting a 10 to 15 pound jack cruise by. Yeah, the, the little ones are very aggressive. I, I found that the, the bigger they get, they are a little bit trickier, but you know, usually anything under four or five pounds will hit at least, you know, the first time. And now I have had trouble where I'll catch one or two from the school and then the school will leave, uh, but they'll, they'll hit, any sort of artificial hard baits, soft baits, um, you know, they take a lot of different stuff. And uh, like you said, I've never tried them. I know in American Samoa, the giant trevally and the bluefin trevally looked almost like the body shape. Cause you know, uh, blue runners are in the same family as Jack Fowl, they're in the same genus, but the, they're not, they're shaped a little bit differently. The, um, the giant trevally and the bluefin trevally, like shape-wise, look identical uh, to the jack Reval. They're a little. The giant trevallies are actually uh, a little bit more narrow-bodied when they're when they're smaller. But the big giant trevally look almost identical, uh, and they fill that same ecological niche. Um, but in Samoa, people would eat the bluefin trevallies a lot more uh, than the giant trevallies. And here you see people catch them. I think there's no size. So people do keep them from time to time, but yeah, I've always been told they're not good to eat, so I've never personally tried them. Um, but it, but it's interesting to hear that uh, that you have. They're okay, you know. They're not my favorite. They're not my least favorite. Um, if I was really craving, you know, some fish tacos or something, or a fish soup, uh, it'd be great. But other than that, um, I typically don't don't keep them. Well, all right, guys, um, I think we're going to call it a day with that. Um, we got a couple more questions and we're hoping to get a guest in soon. So uh, we'll probably record another one this week. Tim's going hunting next week. So probably only release one per week. But uh, hope you guys enjoy and see you next time. Thank you, everybody.